Let's turn into our Bibles to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We're going to, our message is entitled tonight, Living Holy for God. You do understand that your salvation is just the beginning of your Christian life. That's just the beginning point. As a baby is born into the world, as you and I were born into this world, and it pictured for us our beginning point in this life, so our salvation experience, which is a new birth experience, a born-again experience, in fact, as Paul would say, you are an infant in Christ when you're just born again, that this is just the beginning point. Tonight we're going to take a look at what it means to live holy for God as we grow in Him and as we're strengthened in Him and as we live for Him. Let's start with verse 1 in chapter 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We see in these four simple verses, Paul begins to speak to the Colossians saying, we need to live holy for God. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 44 says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate, that word means to be set apart. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy, for I am holy. God says, I want you to be holy because I am holy. Now there is, there are those people who believe that we can become holy like God. But that's not what God is saying. He said, I'm not asking you to be like me, like God, without sin. As we are here in this world, our bodies are trapped in these, this world. Our soul is in our body. The new spirit that we have, the new man that we have is encased in our body. But we still have that old man, that old nature. That's why Paul talks about in Romans, the seventh chapter, the struggle between the old nature and the new nature. Paul, here Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, is saying to us, we have a struggle each and every day of our Christian life. Now, I hope you're not, and I'm not, struggling with the same things we struggled with when we were first Christians. I hope that we've overcome those. I hope we've grown stronger in the Lord and that we have passed by those things. But you know, in reality, we have struggled in our Christian life with the matter of sin all our Christian life. I remember years ago a man telling me, I no longer sin. Stop telling your people uh, that you're a sinner saved by grace. We, I've stopped sinning. I've gone beyond that now. I am now a Christian who does not sin. I said, you just did. He said, what do you mean? I said, you just called God a liar. And I took him to First John and said, if you say you have no sin, you call God a liar. And I said, so you just called God a liar. I said, we don't live a lifestyle of sin. Occasionally we may fall into it. We may be trapped into it. Or we may choose it, but in reality, it is not a lifestyle. We do not make it a lifestyle. And so, therefore, we're going to see tonight how we can live holy for God. The Word of God declares that we are to live holy lives. God desires it. He declares it in the Word and demands it in the Word. That we are to set ourselves apart that we are to be different. Now, there's not one of you in this room, including me, that is perfect and without sin. Oh, beloved, think about this. If I would give you a glass of water, let's say about an eight ounce glass of water, and I would take maybe a small, small little glass of strychnine poison, and I would pour it into your cup, and I'd say, here's a glass of water for you to drink. 
Well, you would be foolish to drink it. You would be foolish to say, well, okay, I realize that there's just a little bit of poison in it, much more water, and so it should be okay. No, it's not. You don't do that. And so what we must understand is that a little sin leavens everything. It makes it leavened. It, it changes your life. It, it's a, it means that you and I, even if we just had one little sin, that we would not be worthy, this body would not be worthy to go into heaven. That's why we die. That's why we have to have a new body. That's why we have to have a new existence in heaven. So living holy for you and I is a daily choice. We choose to live like Christ. We choose to live like our world or we choose to live like Satan. The Christian difference is that we can say no to the evil world. We can say no to Satan because we have the new nature. Paul shares with us in Colossians 3 the two principles needed for living holy for God. Just what is the Christian life? How can we live holy for God? If we have an old nature, if we have an old nature, years ago, my father-in-law used to use this illustration. He said that, that he knew of an Indian man who when he was asked, when he was born again, he says, he said, I'm a born again Christian, but I have two dogs that live within me. And he said, one dog is the dog for God. The other dog is the dog for evil. And he was asked, which dog wins? He says, it's simple. Whichever one I say sick him to. <laughs> he said, whichever one I put in, in charge. And see what we have to understand. It's a daily struggle for each and every one of us that we must choose to follow Christ. We must choose. Sometimes it's a daily choice. Sometimes it's an hourly choice. Sometimes it's a minute by minute choice, beloved. But in reality, we must choose. We live holy for God by living the changed life. When we were born again, we were changed. We're new creations, Paul told the Corinthians. And so we are to live the changed life. And then not only are we to live the changed life, but we're to live the controlled life. Oh, beloved, we have a new uh, entity in our lives today. The Bible says in Romans, the eighth chapter, if you do not possess the spirit of God, you are not his. When we are born again, God places within us, each and every one of us, a new nature. And that new nature is the spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit comes within our lives to give us that new life. And how we live the Christian life is how we are controlled by the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look. First of all, in verses 1 through 2, we see in Colossians chapter 3, living the changed life. Look at verse 1. We need to have a heart for holiness. If then you were raised with Christ, if you were born again, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated, sitting at the right hand of God. You see, this is an action of the will. We must choose our own heart. We must make that choice. I'm going to make that choice to follow Christ. I'm going, the Bible says, to seek those things which are above. You know, when we go to a foreign country or we go uh, to a new life, we have to choose to, to be like them, to live like them, to follow them. And so we see it's the same way. You and I have a, a new home. You and I have a new place we are going, and it's called heaven. So we need to choose this day to live for that place. We see it's a matter of a change. He says in verse 1, If you were raised, if then you were raised with Christ, if you were truly born again, if you were truly a new Creation. Second Thessalon, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
we see that we are, if they were raised with Christ, if we were born again, we are given the ability to choose to live for this different world, this different lifestyle. So we see that we are a new creation. And beloved, let me say this to you. That doesn't mean you become, you become a part of a church. That doesn't mean that you become a, a good person. You determined I'm going to church every Sunday, determined to carry the biggest Bible I can buy, determined to even be baptized, or determined to do all the things I can do uh, that I can be religious. No, that new creation means it's something that happened inside. It means something different happened to you. You have been possessed by the Holy Spirit of God. So we see that you are a literal new creation. Born again, Jesus called it in John, the third chapter. And so we see, number one, a new creation. Number two, we see a new covenant. A new covenant. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and sup with him or dine with him and he with me. We see that we literally have to have Christ, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, to literally come to reside within us. We have that new creation. We're born again. We also have that new covenant that we now are in his image and to live for him. So we see, first of all, it's a matter of change. You have to be born again if you're going to live the Christian life. Otherwise, you're just living a religious life. And just a, living a religious life is not going to give you the strength to overcome sin. Just living a religious life is not going to give you the opportunity and strength and ability to live the Christian life. Oh, beloved, only the power of God in our lives gives us that ability to live for him. So we see it's a matter of change, but it's also a matter of choice. We have a choice now. You see, before we were saved, we didn't have a choice. But we have a choice now. It's a matter of choice. The Bible says, seek those things. Seek those. That's a choice, folks. When you're seeking something, you choose to go seek that. Or otherwise, you don't go seek that. But you see, we have a choice here. Choose a holy life. Paul says, seek those things. Seek those things which are above. Choose a holy life. Determining in your heart that you're going to live a life that reflects the fact that Christ resides within you. Make the decision and say, I'm going to live for God. And purpose in your heart, God has given you the ability, God has given you the strength, now purpose in your heart that you're going to follow him. Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And the Christian life is nothing more than just following Jesus. It's not changing a new sense of rules and regulations. It's not necessarily walking to a different church, but rather it's choosing to follow Jesus. And so we see it's a matter of choice. Choose a holy life and then concede to a holy Lord. The Bible says where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, he's on the throne of God. He is literally seated at the right hand. There is no one else in that position in heaven. Oh, beloved, we see what that means. What does that mean? It means that Christ and the Father are one. They're on an equal plane. They are God, God incarnate. Jesus is God incarnate. God, the, whole, the Father, is God in spirit. They are the tri, triunity of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are one, but yet they are separate. And so we see that he is a holy Lord. He is a holy God. And so he is seated at the Father's right hand. And we're to concede to that holy God and to live for him. Luke chapter 5, 23, again, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, the battle of the dominant will is the issue of salvation and living for him. 
Here's the issue. When Adam was in, in the Garden of Eden, Adam was given a choice. God says you can have, or Jesus said you can have anything in this garden you want to eat, but this one thing you can't have. You can't eat that. That day you eat that, you're going to die. So Adam literally had everything in the garden that was edible that he could eat. And the Bible says that Adam chose that one thing. As long as he ate the other fruits, as long as he ate the other things that were given to him to eat, the Bible says he placed God's will above his. You see, when you place God's will above yours, when you say, God, you're more important, you're in charge. When you say, I'm going to follow you and I'm going to live according to your word, I'm going to live according to your will, I'm going to do what you would have me to do. We place once more, as Adam had done to God first in the garden, to put God's will over his. But the moment that Adam chose to put his will over God's, then it was simple. Sin came into the world. Adam was changed. He died. He didn't die physically. He didn't die emotionally. His soul did not die. But he did die spiritually. So he was no longer in the image of God. And so we see when Adam chose to circumvent God's will over his and chose to put his will over God's, then that was called sin. And you see, that's probably the best definition of sin I can give you. That when you place your will over God's will, that's sin. And that's exactly what we're told about to choose a holy life. What does that mean? That means choosing to put God's will over my will. I tell you, I, I love a story, an illustration. Uh, when when uh, uh, this pastor was at a revival in our church, Bill Stafford was his name. And, and he said... He said it, he was at a church one time and he told all the deacons, now I want you to be here every, every night of the revival. And one deacon came up to him later and said, well, I can't be there every night. He says, what do you mean you can't be there? And he says, well, I got to go bowling on Tuesday. He says, well, here's what you do. He says, you go to Jesus and you say, you want to go bowling or do you want to go to church Tuesday night? And he says, and that's what you do. Well, the guy got mad and he left. Well, that Tuesday night, there he was sitting on the front row. He says, well, what did Jesus say? And Jesus said, I want to go to church. He said, so we went. But anyway, that's exactly what it means to put God first in your life. What would God have you to do? And you know what? The Holy Spirit will tell you, no, you don't need to do that, won't he? You and I know that, don't we? Why is it when kids sneak a cookie out of the cookie char, jar, they always first stop to look around and see who's watching, right? Oh, we do the same thing, folks. But you see, God is there, is he not? God is within you. And sometimes he will tell you, no, 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 don't do that. And so that's that, that's that Holy Spirit speaking to us. So the choice is simple, folks. Living the Jesus-blessed life is living what God would have you to do. It's putting his will first in your life. Next we see in the second verse, a head for holiness. We not only see a heart for holiness, but next we see a head for holiness. This is an acknowledgement of the word. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. You know, we see here, we, we talk about in verse 1, being raised in Christ, seeking the things which are above. Now in verse 2, we see that it's a matter of the acknowledgement of the word in our life. We become subservient to God's word. It's as simple as that. Okay, so, you know, God doesn't open up the sky and a, and a scroll comes down and says, no, don't do that. But if you read the word of God and if you study the word of God, you know, I love the word when the Bible says in, in the book of Psalms, thy word have I hidden in mine heart that I might not sin against you. What is it that causes us to sin? Oh, it's that we want to go against the things of God. What causes us not to sin? Oh, it's the word of God. That's why the devil don't want you in the word. 
That's why he doesn't want you to read it. That's why he doesn't want you to study it. That's why he doesn't want you to memorize it. So that lo and behold, that word of God, it's like an alarm that goes off. When you're getting ready to do something, suddenly you might remember a verse. And you have to choose in your mind at that time. You see, it's an action of the Spirit. Living under the control of the Holy Spirit. Now there are certain designated fruits of the Spirit that we can have if we live in acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit being in charge of our life. Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 22 and 23, gives us a complete listing of all of the fruit of the Spirit that we can have. They're characteristics of Jesus in our life that we should be seeking to have within our life, that our life might reflect Jesus in us. One of those fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Self-control. Now that control is only done through the Holy Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and through His uh, genuine leadership in our lives. And so we see living under the control of the Holy Spirit is an action of the Spirit. In verse 2, set your mind on things above. That's through the Word and through the Holy Spirit's leading. And then we're to live underneath the conformity of the Holy Spirit. Conformity to what? To the conviction of, of his leading. You know, the Bible tells us what's right or wrong. I've had people all my life, it's so difficult, I don't understand, I can't read the Bible. Well, the first thing I ask them is to make sure they're saved. And then secondly, are they living for God? Are they wanting to really follow the word of God? In Ephesians 5.18, the Bible says, And do not be drunk with wine, and which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you're drunk in wine, so to speak, that's very simple. You're under the control of a foreign substance in your body. They used to call it DUIs. I don't know what it's called today, but it used to be called DUIs, uh, driving under the influence under the control of something else. Whether it be a drug or whether it be alcohol, you are driving under the influence. You are driving under a control of some other control in your life. You don't have control of your, your motor abilities. You don't have control of your thinking capacity. Something else does. And so the Bible says in, in Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine. Don't be under the control of that, but be filled with the Spirit. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, folks, that means you're, you're going to, again, put His will, God's will, over yours. Again, Jesus, you want to go bowling or do you want to go to the church service? You follow Jesus, right? It's as simple as that. And so we see the action of the Spirit in our lives. God gave us the Spirit that He would lead us. God gave us the comforter, he calls him in John the 15th chapter, the comforter that he might give it to us, that he would lead us and guide us. And as we read his word, he explains it to us and gives us the meaning of it. So we see an action of the spirit, but then we see an action of self. Keep your ribbon here. Turn a little bit to your right, past Hebrews and past James to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to start with verse 14. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to former lusts, to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. God is saying you don't act like you used to act before you were saved. You don't do the same things you used to do before you were saved. Now, I've shared this with you before. In fact, I think a couple of weeks ago when, when uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers talks about the time a gentleman approached him and said, you Baptists believe you can do anything you want to do and you're still saved. That you can go and do this and do that and God has to forgive you. And, and Dr. Dr. Rogers said something to him, no, sir, that is not true. 
He said, I, even though I, I can do anything and I am eternally, I am eternally saved. But he says, I tell you what I got. Once I got saved, saved I got a new wanter. You see, I don't want to do that anymore. I got a new life. I want to follow Christ. I want to live for Christ. I don't want to do the things I used to do. I don't want to be involved in the things I used to be involved in. I don't want to follow down the trails and the paths I used to go. But rather, I'm a changed, born-again person with new life. So we see it's an action of the self. We choose. And we choose through the power of the Holy Spirit. Also in verse 14 of that same chapter, 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 14, we see we do not conform to this world. As obedient children, not conforming yourself to former lusts as in your ignorance, we do not conform to this world. Verse 15, we are, we be, we are to be conformed to his work. We're to do what God would have us to do. Look at verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Is this what God would have me to do? Is this how Jesus would act? Is this how Jesus would believe? Years ago, we used to get a bracelet. Remember, they had all kinds of little posters and things out. WWJD. What would Jesus do? Well, I tell you, I took it very personal. I thought to myself, you know, I know what Jesus would do. All you got to do is read the Bible. You can tell what Jesus would do. But the question is, what? Not, it's not what Jesus would do, but what would John do? And so it became very personal to me. And so what we have to understand, we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to live to do his work. In verse 16, it says, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Be conformed to his word. Follow his word. Read his word. God will direct you through it. In Psalm 119, turn there quickly, Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the whole Bible. We're not going to read the entire book, the Bible, the chapter of Psalm 119. We're going to start with verse 9 in Psalm 119. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not, I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Do you see how important the word of God is for you and I to live holy lives? The Bible says, how can a young man live the life that God would have him to live? Oh, it's simple, by taking heed according to your word. That's why it's so hard for you to read your Bible. That's why we, we live in perilous times today, folks. The devil wants you to be weak. He wants you to be victims. He wants you to fall in this battle of these last days. And if you want to follow Christ, and if you want to live for him, read his word and, and live according to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7 and 8 says, Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Be holy, and how am I to be holy? By keeping God's word in my life, living God's word in my life. How do I know to do that if I do not read the word? Oh, you don't have to read the whole book. You don't have to read the entire Bible in one day. Folks, just read a couple of verses when you first get up in the morning. When you first get to your destination you're going to, if you have the opportunity to read your Bible, you see, I, I live in a different world than you do. I live in a world where I got over a hundred Bibles in my office. And I can open any of those at any time I want to. My secretary won't say a bad thing about me. She won't cuss at me. She won't fire me. She won't do any of those things. But I know because I've lived in the real world, folks. I've worked in the real world. I know what you're going through when I say this. But, oh, beloved, if you can't do it at work, do it before you get there. I tell you, one of the ways I used to do it was I got showing you how long ago it was. I had cassettes, the Bible on cassette. 
And I would put that in that cassette and I'd play it all the way to work. And you know what? It changes the way you drive too. <laughs> it kind of makes it kind of calm for you and real smooth for you. You don't shake your fist at people. You don't do the things you used to do. Now they still do that to you and do all kinds of things to you, but you don't have to do it with them. Okay. Live for God. Finally, in verse 3 and 4, we see the living the controlled life. We see that we are to live the changed life, but now we see we're going to live the controlled life. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I love that verse. Years ago, I had a woman come into my office down in Florida. And she came to me and says, I got a problem with my husband. And I said to her, ma'am, what, what is that problem? She says, well, he came down here to your church and got that saved stuff. I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> I know where this is going. And I said, well, tell me about it. Well, he came down and, and somebody led him to the Lord and he came home and he poured all the booze out of the refrigerator down the sink and he told me, he said, I'm a changed man. We're going to live a different life. And she said that he would go out on, on, the, on cruises. He was in the Navy. He would go out on cruises and he would find Christians on the, on the ship and they would read their Bible together. And then he'd come back and he'd go to church and and all of a sudden he started taking our children to church. And I didn't want to go with him. She said, I want my old husband back. I said, I'm sorry. It's too late. That old husband you had, he's dead and gone. You got a new man. And he's living like Jesus. She said, well, what's he going to do now? Take my kid. He's been going on Tuesday night visitation with the men. Is he going to take the kid? I said, oh, no, he won't take your child. We don't allow children on visitation until they turn eight. <laughs> but he, she didn't think that was funny. But anyway, folks, listen, we've died. That old man is gone. We're new creations. The Bible says in verse 3 that for you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. So we need to live for Jesus. Though we have died, the old man is still with us. But that, that we are a new creation. And that old man that we used to be all by itself is gone. This is our sanctification. We are to live a life bringing honor and glory to him. Paul, no, Paul notes our death to sin. He says, for you died. It's a new direction. We begin to follow Jesus. Do you remember what it was like when you were first saved? How life was changed? How everything was so new and everything was so exciting and you wanted to live for Jesus? And then you met that old sourpuss at church that said, oh, it's going to change. Don't worry, you'll get over it. <laughs> Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? How can we do it, Paul says? How can we do it when Jesus died for our sins, when Jesus loved us? My pastor down in Florida said one of the ways that he dealt with sin in his life, he said every time he sinned, he asked God to let him hear the hammer ring as it went upon the nails in Jesus' hands and feet. He said, knowing my sins caused that. And that I would hear the ringing of the hammer upon the nail each and every time I would sin. We see that Paul notes our death to sin, a new direction following Jesus. You know, we may fall into sin, but we don't, again, we don't make it a lifestyle. We don't live it like we used to. And then not only do we see a new direction, but we see a new desire. In verse 3, the Bible says, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We have a new fellowship with Jesus. The Bible again says, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now that's a very mysterious thing. 
What in the world does that mean, preacher? I'm living here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I have nowhere near heaven. What does that mean? You know that means that Jesus is right there next to the Father. And he's saying, have you seen my, my child? Have you seen them today? Oh, they're not perfect, but they're choosing to live for you today. You see, he's there telling God all about us. We have a new desire of fellowshipping with Jesus. 1 John 1, 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Oh, that walking in darkness speaks of a lifestyle. Again, folks, we're going to fall into sin. And you know, the younger the Christian we are, the more so we do. And as we grow in grace and as we grow in strength in Christ, we learn how much easier it is to say no to those things that we used to, to say yes to. Paul notes our debt to the Savior. He says, your life is hidden with Christ. We have a debt to give to Jesus. He gave everything for us that we might have eternal life. He gave his life that you and I would have everything forgiven. We would not have to do anything. He paid your price and my price there upon the cross. Jesus saved us. Not only did Jesus save us, folks, our life is hidden in Christ because he secured us too. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Just a little bit to your left. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 and 14. In him, speaking of Jesus, you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Oh, verse 14 says it's a guarantee. And who is that guarantee? The Holy Spirit. He purchased our redemption. We have become the purchased possession. You and I were purchased by him, and he loves us. We were slaves to sin, and he purchased us and freed us that we might live to choose to live for God with a free will choice. God saved us. Jesus secured us. Now back in Colossians chapter uh, 3, verse 4, we see the living with Jesus. Not only, folks, are we, are we living for Jesus, but we're living with Jesus. Look at verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Well, what's he talking about? Well, he could talk about one of two things, folks. He could talk, first of all, about death. You know, death is a reality for all mankind. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But we see in verse 4, we, it says, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also appear with him in glory. Excuse me, that means that we are going to die one day and he will come and take us home. And then also it could mean what, what the Bible talks about in 1 Thessalonians, also in, in 1 Corinthians, also in many places that Paul is writing about this matter of Jesus coming for the bride, for the rapture, and the resurrection. We see that we need to understand that Jesus is going to come for us. Not an angel, not some, not some uh, uh, messenger for us. The Apostle Paul isn't coming for us. The Apostle John isn't coming for us, but rather Jesus is coming for us and he's going to take us home. So we are to look for his coming. We are to live our lives looking for his coming, knowing that it could be any moment, any day, any hour, any, any opportunity. 
He might be here tonight for us. We don't know on our way home he might come. I tell you, I understand and believe this with all my heart that we are to look for his coming. Titus 2, 3, 13 says, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Years ago, I, I had a friend who was in the ministry who worked with me at the church in Florida. And he had a funeral of a dear lady, an elderly lady who had died. And the family had shared with him one of the most interesting, interesting occasions that happened to their mother. They had all had been taking time with mom sitting at her bed. She was uh, in the last stages of, of, uh, of the disease that was going to take her life. And they came into the bedroom and they would sit next to her. And then one day mom said to the, the, the child who was there in the, in the room, who is that out there by the, uh, by the tree? Who's that? Who's that out there? The child got up, looked out the window and said, mom, there's, there's nobody out at the tree. And a couple of hours went by and, and mom said again, who is that looking in the window? And the child who was there at that time said, Mom, there, there's nobody looking in the window. And they just attributed it to the medication she was taking and never said anything about it. So finally all the, uh, the children were coming into the room. It was late. And people had gotten off work. They'd come to visit her. And she said, Who was that over in the corner? I, I don't know who that is. And they said, Mama, there, there's nobody in the corner. Then a few hours passed and mama was there in the bed and suddenly she said, oh, it's you, Jesus. And she had had a stroke and her arm had been paralyzed and that paralyzed arm reached up, grabbed the hand of Jesus and died and went home to be with him. And folks, that's just as simple as it's going to be. One day he's going to come for us. So we're to live our lives for him today. When Christ is who our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Whether it be by death or by rapture, folks, we're going to be with him. We see a looking for his coming. Live as children of light. Live this, as this, this is your last day and you're looking for Jesus' coming. Live as Christians leaving. This is not our home Oh, I love that song, We're Just Passing Through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Oh, beloved, think about that. We're to live for the next world to come. A balance of living both each day, living as children of light and children who are leaving, both each day expecting the soon return of Jesus. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we're to look for his coming and we're to live for his coming too. Seek his will daily. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Purpose in your life to live for God in your life. Share his word daily. Share with people each and every day. You know how simple evangelism is? It's very simple. We used to say this years ago when we'd have in our church in Florida a thing called Operation Andrew. And Andrew had a simple phrase. He would just say, come and see. Come and see. And that's all you have to do to become a soul winner, become a work, a worker in evangelism. Come and see. You say, well, I don't know how to lead somebody to Christ. Just tell them, come and see. Give them a track, Bible, say, come and see. And so we see living with Jesus. We're to look for Jesus. We're to live for Jesus. And we're to live the changed life. Be holy. Leviticus 20 and verse 7 says, For I am the Lord your God. It's a command of God to live a holy life. It is a choice of every Christian to live a holy life. Colossians 3, 1, Seek those things which are above. 
How can we live the holy life for God? By living the changed life. Do not forget what has happened to you. Don't forget you're a new person. Don't forget that God placed in your heart the Holy Spirit. And that you no longer have a wanter to do those things. So live a changed life and live the controlled life. And that's your choice today. That's your choice today. How am I going to live for God? When you go to bed tonight, thank God for the day that you have. When you wake up in the morning, thank, for the, thank God for the day he's given you. And say, Jesus, what can I do for you today? And I promise you, he'll lead you in that direction. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. But more especially at this time, we thank you, Father, for the teaching and the application of the Holy Spirit, the word of God in our heart. Oh, Father God, do not let us leave this place without being saved, without receiving Christ as our Savior. And Father God, do not let us leave this place without a promise to God that we're going to live for him. And that we can choose to walk with him in our life yet ahead. Be with us tonight, Father God, as we opened your, as we opened your word, that your word would be, would find a place in our heart that we would live for you. And if there be someone here tonight or someone watching on YouTube or, or on Facebook, who have never received Jesus, let this be their opportunity today. Let them understand that each and every one of us were born sinners. Every person was born with the nature of sin in our life. And that nature of sin is also caused death. And as we're all floating in this same boat, we know that death is coming. The boat is sinking. And that some of us in that boat have a life preserver, and his name is Jesus. And, oh, Father God, help them understand that life is sacred and sweet, but also life starts with a sin nature. And help them understand that Jesus died for each and every one of their sins that they committed. If they'll confess they are sinners, and, and if they'll repent of their sins, and come to Christ who died for each and every one of their sins and rose from the dead to give them life everlasting, if they will come to him and ask him for forgiveness, invite him into their heart, they can be saved, born again, to receive the Spirit of God in their life. Oh, Father God, let them pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I, I know and repent of my sins. And I now know that Jesus is the Son of God and he died for each and every one of my sins and he rose from the dead to give me life everlasting. I believe this, Jesus. And now I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart and save my soul and to the best of my ability, I'll live the rest of my life for you. Thank you, Jesus. As we continue in prayer, Father, give those people who prayed that prayer, perhaps on Facebook or on YouTube or even here, that they would make that public. Tell a family member or a friend or even come in a service like tonight. Come forward and say, I've invited Jesus into my heart. Follow him and, and believers' baptism and live the rest of their life for him. And oh, Father God, let this be a house of prayer tonight. If there are those who need to pray, let them come. Whatever decision that needs to be made tonight, let it be done for your honor and your glory. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. 
Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Blessed be the tie that binds